All right, what's up, boys? As promised, we have the highly hyped up prize fight of the Good Morning versus the SLDL slash RDL. There's a bunch of different ways that you can discuss it. It's nuanced. I'm not just going to shit on one exercise in favor of the other. Because a strength, as a strength and conditioning coach, it's not my job to pick my favorite exercise, my personally preferred exercise. It's to get a need versus want analysis manage injury and fatigue, and then coincide that with someone's particular goals. It always boils down to two basic things. Bodybuilding or strength tra or hypertrophy training, popcorn muscles or strength training, pumpkin muscles. Popcorn muscles are very fluffy and they're big, but they're frail. Pumpkin muscles are hard and dense and resilient. Bought on me, man, Lord. But both styles of training are respectable. I value either or both, depending upon what I'm looking to do at the moment. You can delineate both of these based upon a variety of factors in both of these two, two main areas of uh, interest. We're gonna talk about bodybuilding first, only because the more obvious answer is strength training. And I don't want to do the obvious answer here. I want to give probably some things that you haven't considered on the bodybuilding front. Now, just spoiler, I do think that at some point, just finding something to fucking erase this board with, shit. I do these things in one take, guys. I'm an expert, but, you know, like I said, we do shit in one take. Like I was saying though, I do think that you eventually will end up using a stiff legged deadlift or an RDL for bodybuilding, just spoiler, but it's, it's, it's not as simple as that. It just depends on a variety of things and where you're at, what you're looking for, things like that. So let's first start with the bodybuilding. So a few things that you want to keep in mind when you have a bodybuilding program, it's volume, how long you can keep something in, so the time, the frequency, and then recovery. We're gonna talk about the, the Romanian deadlift and the SLDL first. Now in terms of training volume, you're gonna be able to use a pretty high training volume. The reason why that is, is that with a stiff-legged deadlift or an RDL, use myself comparatively, for example. If I were to do like a conventional deadlift for reps, to get the stimulus that I get from an RDL, I would need to use 10, 15, 20% more weight. It's the difference between using 400s versus 500s for reps. That level of axial loading versus what I would be doing on a deadlift is significantly lower. It's not zero, but it's still high, low enough that I can do five sets of 10 on something like a Romanian deadlift or a stiff-legged deadlift. And I'll feel it, but it's not going to destroy me and take away from everything else like a conventional deadlift, like a sumo deadlift would do. So you can use as much training volume as you need to on it. You will have to manage a few other things, but that just comes with training. There's give and take with training. The amount of time that you can do it for. With that comes in things like overuse injuries, things getting tweaked, anything that would stop you from being able to consistently have something in your program. Now with a stiff-legged deadlift or an RDL, you're gonna be able to use that for as much time as you need to, provided that your form with it is good. So you're not rounding your back like a banana, which isn't bad necessarily, but if you're flexing and extending your spine throughout the range of motion, like a, a fucking wet noodle, it's gonna hurt you. But starting with a rounded lower back is fine as long as you keep that solid throughout the range of motion. Frequency is something that you can use Pretty good on a Romanian deadlift or a stiff-legged deadlift as well. Currently, I do both. So it's two times a week that I'm doing it. Technically three if you count the cone rows that I'm doing as well. Recovery, that coincides with the training volumes. Five sets of 10 on something like a Romanian deadlift, I'm gonna be able to recover from week to week. 
overall it's solid in terms of a bodybuilding exercise. There's a fifth factor that we're going to put in here uh, a little bit later after we talk about how it compares with the good morning. Now with the good morning, it's a little bit different. You can use, let me use a different color for this. You can use just as much volume, if not more, because the axial, axial loading is lower. The time factor is a little bit different and it's a little bit different for a few specific reasons that coincide with this fifth category that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Let's just get a little closer. The time factor, like I said, has to do with the injuries that you potentiate from doing an exercise. When you do something like a good morning, you have to externally rotate your elbows. That means turn them out. That puts a lot of stress on your rotator cuff. Now, if you're someone that's sedentary, like a lot of people that I train are, something like a good morning, and I'm not a nocebo guy here by any means, but you do have to be cognizant of these things and manage them appropriately to be able to continue to do an exercise with any appreciable training volume. If you're already for the first time squatting with a lot of volume for the first time in your life or benching heavy, Doing something like a good morning where you're just further biasing that external rotation, it could potentially cause an injury, cause a tweak, cause you to overuse that rotator cuff muscle. Now there are preventative things that you could do to make that honestly a non-factor, which is working your rotator cuff muscle with uh, external rotation, that's either with a band or with a cable machine. but. Just gonna keep it a buck. Most of you are not going to do that unless like you injure yourself. So in terms of time, you're not gonna be able to do a good morning with a straight bar for as long as you would be able to do a Romanian deadlift or a stiff-legged deadlift, all things equal. So in that regard, the stiff-legged deadlift or the RDL wins. Now in terms of frequency, the good morning wins because it's less axial loading. Axial loading is an area of recovery that people don't think about until it's too late. You never think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm putting too much weight on my spine and that's impeding my ability to recover. You're more concerned with the, your, your lower back soreness. You can have no lower back soreness and because of your training, depending upon what you're doing, still have a good, a good size recovery deficit because of the amount of axial loading that you have. With a good morning, you're not getting any of that. That actually reminded me of something I wanted to cover in the time aspect. Another thing that could stop someone like a beginner from doing something like a good morning for any appreciable amount of time is their form deficit. That's something that we talked about with the stiff leg at deadlift, but it has to be mentioned with the good morning as well. For the same reason, it's just magnified. It goes all back in to the, the mechanics and the leverages of the lift, right? So if you have a fishing pole or just like a stick just use this marker, for example, even. Me pushing down on the end of this marker with the same force with this hand, so this is the external weight, it's far harder to keep it straight than it is if I'm just pushing here. I can pull to infinity right here, and it's not really going to do the same as if I did it here. You see, even it's starting to bow. Now, just think about... There's very minimal axial loading, but there's a lot of shear going on that starts at the upper back, goes down into the pelvis into your SI joint. If you do not, as someone that's newer to training, know how to brace your core or brace your lower back or keep everything like that nice and stable, you're going to subject yourself potentially to more injury. Not only that as well, but with a good morning, a lot of times, if you're using a good range of motion, and we'll talk about that in a second too. And just let's just say you're at your ninth rep and you might not get the, the, the tenth one. It's either pretty much, unless you have safety pins set up, you get the rep or you know you, you roll the bar in front of you and you you bang the back of your, your skull with the bar or whatever. It's just not as safe as a stiff-legged deadlift or Romanian deadlift. If you can't pick a deadlift up, you're just not gonna pick it up. Like there's there's no injury risk associated with failing a rep on something like that. So that can impede your time 
aspect of it. Now, in terms of actual recovery, good morning is better. You can recover better from a good morning than you can from a stiff-legged deadlift. Where I'll say that they're both equal practically the fucking marker is dry. Piece of shit. Where, where I would say that they're equal though is that practically in a well-structured strength and conditioning program, you're going to be able to recover from whatever volume of stiff-legged deadlifts that you're doing in your program. It's going to be it's going to be harder on your recovery the day after, but if you give yourself an adequate amount of rest days, you're going to be recovered for your Monday session anyway. So what, what, what does it really matter realistically that you just feel a little worse the day after? In terms of training, now there is holistic benefits of, you know, not feeling as beat up the day after you doing good mornings because it just makes your general maneuvering around in life easier, but... In terms of training, practically, there's no difference in terms of recovery. There is, but practically, it doesn't matter because you're going to be recovered for your next session anyway. I feel beat up after doing my RDLs on Friday, but by Monday, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? So, And I do this cyclically over and over and over and over again. Range of motion is something that we have to talk about before we talk about this, uh, this, fifth, this fifth capacity that we're going to mention. Range of motion on a good morning versus a Romanian deadlift. On a good morning, you can get essentially what you're looking for with both of these exercises is 90 degrees. This is the level of hip extension that you want to have to go through. So 90 degrees is what you want for both. You can get that on a good morning, but as a beginner, at, again, I say again, the amount of bracing that you need to get and have on lock to be able to do this safely as a beginner is extremely high. The amount of time that you'll need as a trainee to build that ability to brace, you may as well have used that doing a good morning or a stiff legged, or a stiff legged deadlift or an RDL, in my opinion. Because you can achieve this far easier on a stiff legged deadlift or an RDL than you would on a good morning. It's just how, it, working with some, so many people for so long, that's just how it works out, practically. But in terms of range of motion, they can be equal, so we'll have to equalize them there. Now, in terms of movement pattern and how, how effective the movement pattern can be, the heavier you get the, the, the load to be, and then as well, what do you do when you it becomes harder to add weight to the movement? This will segue nicely into the hypertrophy, uh, the strength aspect of it, because the two kind of go hand in hand. But with a good morning, and we're gonna use uh, we're gonna use myself as an example, and then talk about one of the strongest, most elite power lifters of all time that I have extreme respect for what we're going to use as an example because that's just what we do we don't have parasocial relationships here with the good morning and this is something that you've probably heard before you start to lose the movement pattern the the heavier the load on the bar gets so fucking piece of shit stand sorry this uh there we go so let's just say like myself, weigh 170 pounds, right? So you weigh 170 pounds and you have 185 pounds on the bar. Fuck, I wrote an R instead of a five. Fucking dyslexic. Um, as this starts to get greater than this, you're gonna start turning it from a hip hinge where like I said, you're trying to get 90 degrees with this and have as little knee bend here as possible, as little knee extension as possible. You're going to start to get less hip extension and more knee extension. It's gonna turn more into a squat the heavier that you get. 
The reason of that has nothing to do with your strength per se. It has to do with how gravity interacts with you. If you have something on your back right here and it weighs 185 pounds and you weigh 170 pounds, leverage dictates that this is going to feel like it weighs like a million fucking pounds and it's going to tip you over. To prevent you from tipping over, your body is just naturally going to extend at the knees more and not allow as much hip extension. That angle is going to close up a little bit. Slowly but surely, the more you go over body weight. 185 even, this is going to start to happen. 15 pounds different, it'll start to happen. Now with a stiff-legged deadlift or a Romanian deadlift, the, the, the range of motion is not going to be limited by the, the amount of weight on the bar. It's just, to me, it's a no-brainer. So here's the debate. We explain some of the pros and cons. Here's the debate, and here's where I say that you're gonna end up doing a stiff-legged deadlift or an RDL for hypertrophy at some point if you are not doing that now. The area of debate was, okay, you can use less weight here, um, get a better range of motion, use no more than body weight, and get a full range of motion and use less load versus me just using more weight here. Okay, so that's that's people's main talking points. Between that and, oh, it takes me less time to warm up, which we'll address later. At some point, you can progressively overload, say, a 170-pound full range of motion good morning by doing a number of things. So you can slow down the eccentric. You can do them dead stop or that's practically all that you can do other than increase load. Okay, so unlike the natural limit, this fucking scientific physical limit does exist. It does exist. You will be able to use no more than your body weight before it starts to turn into a squat and then it becomes more and more useless as a hypertrophy exercise for the purpose of doing a hip hinge. So what are you left with here? Whereas on a stiff-legged deadlift or a, you know, a Romanian deadlift, if you're someone that can do a good morning with 170 pounds for like 10 reps, you might be doing like 300 for the same number of reps on either a stiff-legged deadlift or a Romanian deadlift. You can do all of these same things here. So all of this here, you can do here as well, okay? What you can also do here is add load to infinity without losing the movement pattern, because again, this is your limit. 170, your body weight, whatever that is, is your limit. You can feed this with a lighter exercise. You could build capacity and build your ceiling with the stiff-legged deadlift with another exercise. Where do you go lighter? Where do you go lighter in a lower tier exercise that is less fatiguing and that you can use to build capacity in a good morning? A good morning is an exercise that you could actually use as, to, as an exercise to build capacity in this one. You have to think about things in tiers. And I'm going to use the butler press as an example. Because people love asking me about the butler press. And I'm super excited that people are excited about that exercise. And they see the benefits of it. And they see why I'm doing it personally. But I have to explain something more at length. Just because, of, you know, people, people ain't tracking on it. You have a main variation. This is how we're going to segue into strength training after we're done talking about this. You have a main variation. You feed that main variation with a self-limiting variation, right? So this could be a deadlift, the main variation. This could be a deadlift. This could be uh, competition style bench press, competition style squat, competition style overhead press, 
Okay, tracking? So you have your self-limiting variation. That's your Romanian deadlift. That's your Larson press. That's your pause squat. That's your paused overhead press. There's gonna become a point where if you're someone who is training this lower tiered exercise, a good morning would be this lower tiered exercise, you're going to need to feed this exercise with another one. That is an inevitable eventuality of your training. It doesn't matter, I don't care who you are. You're gonna have to feed this. You're gonna have to build your ceiling, your capacity in this exercise to then build this one. If you're a good morning, you're limited by your body weight. Find me one exercise where you're gonna use 170 pounds on a hip extension exercise that is reasonably distant in terms of loading that's gonna give you an actual training effect. What are you gonna do, fucking body weight good mornings? You're not gonna get a training effect from that. You're not gonna be able to feed your, good, your actual strict good morning at all, unless you wanna start doing things like a safety bar good morning is your main exercise and then, and then a, a, a straight bar good morning is my secondary exercise to feed it and build capacity. Just do a fucking stiff-legged deadlift, dude. You're making it more complicated than it needs to be. But anyway, we're gonna relate it to the butler press. This self-limiting variation here is the butler press, okay? So track what I'm saying right now. 315 times eight on a competition-style bench press is pretty difficult for me. Two we'll say 275 to 280 for eight is pretty difficult for me on a Larson press. 245 times eight on a Butler press is pretty difficult for me. The exertion on all three of these is the same. You tracking what I'm saying? If you're a good morning, you can't get, go lower than here. You're already pretty much down at the butler press level, quite honestly. I know I said it was here, but you're honestly probably already at this third tier, this third level of escalation. So with that in mind, if you want to stay true to the spirit of low SFR and being able to progressively load it past the point of your body weight in terms of pounds, here, in, here comes our solution to that. It's gonna be able to allow you to just use that as a main exercise for longer. With this in mind, you're still going to have to eventually do a stiff-legged deadlift, unless you get really strong on them. I'm in the 600 pound range on a conventional deadlift. I'm, I do this particular exercise on the easiest variation, I think with 345 pounds for a one rep max. Pete Rubish, uh, who I got the exercise from, does them with 450 pounds for a one rep max and he deadlifts over, uh, over 900 pounds. So the amount of juice you get for the squeeze with this exercise is even limited. But one way that you can kind of solve this and hold off having to use a stiff-legged deadlift or a Romanian deadlift for, for longer as like a bodybuilder is the back extension. Now, what do we get with a back extension? We get, okay, so we'll, you use two different back extensions, for example. We got the 90-degree the the, the, the john where your legs are here and you can hang down at a 90-degree angle. Here's your peanut head. Um, here's your dumbbell that you're, that you're holding. And you're still able to get that 90 degrees of range of motion, okay? This for the bodybuilder, the 90 degree hyper is excellent, right? You're gonna be able to load it to infinity, practically, and not lose this movement pattern. The reason why that's different from a good morning is because leverage is working in your favor here because, you know, excuse like the fucking, the stick shapes, but you know what the fucking a glute ham device looks like. You know, don't fuck with me. Um, <laughs> leverage in your, in your case is working in your favor because you have this artificial device that's 
stopping you from falling the fuck over. It, this probably weighs like 500 pounds or it's nailed to the ground or whatever. And it's just gonna allow you to be able to do this with progressively larger weights for longer. I've had 250 pounds on, on this before for a set of 10. It, it, it's just, the, the machine stopped me from falling over. I can't, you, you, but I can't do that on a good morning without turning it more into a squat. Now, another one that you can do, and this is more strength specific as well, is your 45 degree hyper that you can kinda, you know, you're not quite getting 90 degrees, it's more like 70 degrees. But the cool thing with this is, is that the joint angles, here's your peanut head, here's the weight that you can have on your back. The joint angles are more specific to a pull off the floor. It's more strength specific, it's still pretty good for hypertrophy because you're getting a really good targeted uh, isometric contraction and a dynamic contraction actually with your lower back and as well in your glutes. It targets both of those things much better than a good morning. You get weight, you get the same stretch in your hamstrings as well. And as with this, you can load it to infinity for the exact same reason. This one right here, you can load heavier than this one. So you can somewhat, for a while anyway, use this as your main hip hinge if you're a bodybuilder and use a good morning as your variation that you use to build capacity in this one before eventually you have to, you, you're going to reach the point where when you're doing 315 pounds on this, you're going to need to use the Romanian deadlift and then use this as a means to build the Romanian deadlift, which is used as a means to build your deadlift. And then you're gonna need something like a good morning to build this. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's it, it, everything works in tiers and you're not gonna realize it, that you need it until you need it. You see what I'm saying? Like if you're not very strong yet, yeah, you can use a good morning. All things equal in a vacuum, lower stimulus to fatigue, less time to warm up, all that jazz. But practically, you're not gonna be able to just use a good morning as your main hip hinge for the rest of your training career. For all the reasons that we specified. Now, one thing that I wanna mention before we start to talk about the strength part of um, this good morning video is I mentioned before um, that your external rotation can get overtrained on a straight bar good morning. It can get overtrained even on uh, the Hanma back raises, I call them. The absolute lowest tier hip hinge that you could use in terms of the amount of weight that you use on it. I use, I think, 50, 60 kilos on it for a set of 8 to 10. See what I'm saying? The safety bar, good morning, is really good um, just in terms of it's harder than a regular good morning. It works your spinal erectors harder. It doesn't require you to externally rotate at all. You're actually internally rotating. Everything is still, you have to brace super hard. All those things that I said about the good morning potentially being dangerous because of your lack of ability to brace, all those things still apply. But in terms of that overtraining the external rotation, doesn't do that. So the jetpack good morning is really good. If you're a bodybuilder for a long time, just because like I said, it's harder, you're gonna be able to use it for longer, I guess is what I'm saying. Now, in terms of strength, this is where it's less of a nuanced discussion. And I'm gonna just, good mornings have, the only place in a good morning, the only place good mornings have on a strength training program is to build capacity for a heavier hip hinge. Now, what do I mean by that? 
there's a certain point in a strength training program where you're not going to be able to add more sets of whatever your heavier lift is. So you're going to need to do lower tiered movements to build capacity in that main movement, just like with bodybuilding. The only difference is, is that one, you're using them as a means of driving, driving hypertrophy to have more strength potential in a strength training program, but you're using them to build work capacity that's hard for you to build with something like straight bench press sets or straight squat sets or straight deadlift sets. Can't really do that unless you're a thick bone individual. You just made a steel cable. Then that won't apply to you. But if you're someone like me where you have relatively thin wrists, I have like, you know, thin joints everywhere. I need to use other exercises to build my work capacity and to build hypertrophy with. That's one aspect of it, okay? Everything that I said in terms of using exercises to feed the capacity in that exercise, you still run into those same limitations on a strength training program if you're using a lighter exercise. You can't, as someone that benches 225, train a butler press because you're not gonna get anywhere with it. What are you gonna do to train the butler press? You see what I'm saying? Joint angle specificity, as well as the mechanical load that you're using on an exercise is very, very important when you're talking about strength training, such that, for example, things are only going to have strength carryover one tier up, meaning my butler press does not necessarily have carryover as the third tier exercise to my first tier exercise, which is the competition style bench press. But it does have carryover to the Larson press, which does have carryover to the bench press. You see what I'm saying? But all of these things need to be used synergistically. A belt squat. Same thing. It has to be used synergistically with a regular squat. A Romanian deadlift will have automatic carryover to a deadlift because it's the next tier down. If you're only doing these third tier exercises, your mechanical load is not high enough for it to have carryover for you to be able to perform here. So if you're someone that, you know, you, you do good mornings, whatever, for whatever amount of weight, that a 600 pound deadlifter could do, you're not going to be able to express 600 pound deadlifter strength until you start performing exercises here and here. A good morning, like we said, is here, it's down there. It's a very light exercise. You're not gonna get any mechanical load that's gonna allow you to be able to demonstrate any top end strength. Now, movement specificity. What's more specific to a deadlift? What builds the upper back in a way specific to a deadlift? A good morning where the bar is on your back or a Romanian deadlift or a stiff-legged deadlift where the bar is in your hands and the joint angles are the same and you're getting the same stress on your upper back and on your lats. It's gonna be the stiff-legged deadlift or the RDL 10 times out of 10. 10 times out of 10, it's gonna be the, that exercise. That is gonna have infinitely more carry over to a deadlift just for the fact that you're holding the bar in your hand and it's a similar, you're going through similar joint angles. When, when have you ever deadlifted anything off the floor with your fucking neck, you see what I'm saying? You're not Jack Honda. You're not deadlifting shit off the bar with, your, with, the, with, with, the, with, the, with the with the bar in your teeth. You're just not, you're not doing that, you know what I'm saying? Now, here's where we talk about the worst fucking abomination exercise that I've ever heard about. You know, I bet there's some of you that were waiting for me to talk about this. This is where I just shit on an exercise. I don't often shit on very many exercises, but this exercise truly has no place in a strength and conditioning program. And it has to be part of this conversation because people have turned it into a good morning variation. It's the power good morning, it's the squat morning. All of those things that we talked about that make an exercise valuable for hypertrophy or strength, a squat morning has none of them. So as we mentioned, if you if I weigh 100, 
70-ish pounds, right? And I have 315 pounds on a good morning where I would be able to do this on a good, on a, like a strict good morning, you know? That's, that's my head, that's my feet, here's the weight, here's my arms. Squat good morning. That's my feet, that's my arms. This is the level of range of motion and level of hip extension I'm getting. And here is the level of knee extension that I'm gonna have to do. It's a, it's, it's, it's a quarter squat and a quarter good morning. Now, okay, joint angle specificity. This is the, the only argument that you could use for the, the squat morning being a, a, having any fucking benefit at all is for the squat, right? Because positionally, this is a very similar joint angle to what you would have on a squat when you're coming up because it's a fucking quarter squat. But you have to ask, ask yourself, wait, I can get this level of hip extension on a regular squat a uh, regular squat with way less weight. Why don't I just do that? And here in rock, herein lies the uh, the problem with that. You you would just use a fucking squat variation for carryover to a squat, you dickhead. You wouldn't use a squat morning, you you fucking numb skull. You're gonna end up using way more weight than you need to. For the, uh, a fringe benefit that you could just get on a squat variation. So that's, we just address the benefit of a squat morning. Benefit, okay? Because it's intrinsic just to any hip extension that you can get on any exercise. Now let's talk about the RDL, okay? Or the stiff legged deadlift. Tons more hip extension. Less weight. Weight equals less but you get a more effective range of motion. The bar is in your hands. You're training your hip extension to an extreme extent. That in of itself is still gonna have carryover to your squat, the hip extension portion of it. You'll still need to train your legs with squat variations, so belt squats, things of that sort, but you're getting that strength carryover. You're getting the mechanical tension through an effective range of motion and not just loading up a, a bunch of weight because that's what you're doing. And the reason why I'm so gung-ho about that is because it's a West Side Barbell talking point. They say that if you can, if you can good morning a certain weight, you'll be able to squat it. Need I say more? Now in terms of strength specificity, okay? We're not shitting on the good morning overall. I just had to shit on that particular exercise because it's, it's not an exercise. It's an exercise in futility, an exercise in ego. The variation that you would use, okay, so we're gonna talk about strength training now. Deadlift, first variation. Second variation, RDL slash SLDL. Third variation, here's where you could use a stiff leg, good morning, to an extent. If you're pretty strong, you're gonna have to use that back extension that we talked about. Fourth exercise, fourth tier. The Han Marais, aka the Lou back extension, aka the cloak off raise. Um, I don't, I don't know whatever other Olympic weightlifters do that. It's an Olympic weightlifting accessory movement. You could also use here something like a cone row, anything like that. Here's how a well-structured strength training program would eventually boil down to. So the stronger you get, the lower down you're going to have to go. Okay? 
Not for bodybuilding. Who the fuck is testing me? Okay, I'll, I'll, there's a client texting me. I got a work phone. It says song. Uh, I got two two phones. One for the bitches, one for the hoes. However it goes. Let me know if y'all listened to that before. Now for bodybuilding. Good mornings are fine, okay? But keep in mind, there's still only a second or third tier movement. So, you got the second, and you got the first. Eventually, you're not going to be able to add load to a good morning. You can slow down the eccentric to, to progressively overload. You're still going to reach that limit of body weight eventually with a dead stop, five second eccentric good morning. You're going to start to lose benefits of the good morning by adding more weight. Okay. You're still going to end up eventually doing an SLDL or a RDL. Your first tier movement as a bodybuilder, someone built or some, you know someone building general strength, is going to be an RDO or an SLDO. Still pretty heavy. It's heavy enough to the point where you can treat it as a main exercise. If you exclusively train these two as a bodybuilder, this would be tier zero. I don't have the room to write it because I wrote this shit at the top, but a tier zero would be if you chose to do a deadlift. You could immediately, if you can do like say 315 for three sets of tone on a stiff legged deadlift, you could deadlift 500 pounds with a you know a couple a couple of weeks of singles. It would be first tier stiff legged deadlift, second tier uh, you know slash Romanian deadlift, second tier back extensions. 90 degree because you can load them heavier for longer and still less load than this. Your second or your third tier exercise, which could be dependent upon your strength level. That's why there's the differentiation it could be the good morning. And then your fourth, third or fourth would be Honda. That's it, y'all. I mean, like I said, for for bodybuilding, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing a good morning. Because like I said, what you're looking for with a hip hinge for bodybuilding is a full range of motion with your hip extension. You can get that with a good morning to an extent. If you're strong enough that you need to do an RDL, Please do an RDL because you're not, you're, you're, this back angle, this level of hip extension is going to keep creeping up and up and up. And so you're doing a squat morning and then you're not a bodybuilder anymore. You're a fucking mucinex booger. You're a west side troglodyte. Um, and like I said, guys, it just depends upon what you need. Like I said in the beginning, it's a need versus want analysis. Someone that I can train in person after a little while, to have good bracing on fundamental exercises like rows, uh, dumbbell rows, things like that, I would absolutely have them do a good morning because, like I said, we don't need to do anything like a deadlift anyway. We just need to put some muscle on them, and the less weight, the better, provided that they can use proper form, which if you're working with me, you're going to be using proper form and have the minimum level of strength to be able to brace properly. Likewise, with their training, with their pressing, rather, I wouldn't use a whole lot of, um, you know, externally biased uh, pressing exercises. So we would do more close grip bench pressing, close grip overhead press, close grip dumbbell press, things like that. It's all about need versus want. This will be fully time stamped. If there's anything that you would like me to expound upon or questions that you have, please leave them in the comments down below. Oh, one more thing I want to address in terms of uh, 
picking a good morning over um, an RDL as a bodybuilder. Warm up time, okay. Because you're not using very much load on a good morning, the idea with that is, is that you have to warm up less. I still think that you should warm up pretty thoroughly just because you're at such of a leverage disadvantage because it's on your back. But we'll go into the impression that, okay, you don't have to warm up very much, okay? And then it takes a lot longer to warm up for Romanian deadlifts than stiff-legged deadlifts. I'm gonna give you a, a bit of truth as someone in the 600 class of deadlifting. I only have to use Romanian deadlifts for 400 pounds for sets of, for sets of 10. Marcellus Williams, really strong deadlifter. He deadlifts in the mid 600s. My boy Riley on Instagram, like there's, a, there's a, a lot of people that I can cite that are in that strength level tier that only use 400s on uh, Romanian deadlifts. I'm gonna break down how long it takes for me to warm up for my main working set on Romanian deadlifts. It's five reps with the bar, five times bar, plus five kettlebell swings. That might take 30 seconds, okay? I rest 30 seconds, I do five times 135, same thing here, do five more swings, five times 225, same thing. At this point, my hips are nice and woken up, so I'm not doing the swings anymore, okay? Now I'm doing two times 315, one times 365, one times 385, and then I'm going into my working set of 10. Uh, one times 10 at 405. That's how that breaks down. In between these is 30 seconds. Even when the weight gets heavier here and closer to my working weight, one set of one with 385 is like abysmal fucking exertion. It's abysmal RPE. Rest 30 seconds, you're going to be able to go right into your next warm-up set. You're going to be good to go. So that's just to address that. So again, practically, just like with the recovery thing, yeah, okay, you can recover better with a good morning, but you, are you, motherfucker, are you not resting? Like, do you not have rest days in your program? If you give yourself adequate rest days and program that appropriately, the fact that you're a little bit, bit more destroyed with a uh, RDL versus a good morning, it doesn't matter practically. You're, just, you're still gonna be recovered from Monday's workout. Same thing as here. Yeah, it takes less time to warm up on a good morning, but you spend more time on your phone in between sets on YouTube than you do warming up for fucking Romanian deadlifts. Like, come on now. And a lot of you guys watching this, you're not doing 405 for 10 reps. There's probably three of you that are on my strength level or higher. I'm not like bragging or anything. I'm just saying that like more than likely, you're... A lot of y'all might be at the 315 level. You see what I'm saying? Where you can do 315 for a set of 10, and then you don't have to do all these up to the 315 for warm-ups. And the warm-up time will be even shorter. It's a non-factor, really, but if you want to be pedantic, yeah, you can warm up quicker on a good morning. But anyway, this will be timestamp. Let me know what y'all think in the comments down below, things that you want me to address, questions you have. Y'all be easy.